The price is right. The idea of what Jesus Christ did for us. The price that he paid. You know, in our culture today, we say this, he died on the cross. And so often we say that and it becomes so easy for us to say, Jesus died on the cross. We even wear crosses around our neck. We put tattoos on our body and we, we have no problem with the emblem of the cross. It is the most worldly, worldwide known symbol is the cross. Whether they accept Jesus as their Lord, everybody knows what that cross represents. And when we look at the cross, the cross itself does not do anything for our salvation. But what was done upon that cross does everything for our salvation. So to talk today about what is important, I think the first thing we need to do is we have to understand what is the crucifixion? What is the crucifixion? You know, we could pick about all kinds of different emblems, whether uh, it was the loaves of bread or whether it was, it was um, the cross. We could talk about all kinds of different emblems, what we talk about. But Josephus called the crucifixion the most wretched of all deaths. The most wretched of all deaths. Why would that be? If you could stay with me for a little while, we've all been around Easter. And we've all seen a portrayal of the crucifixion. We've all seen that Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we see that he was taken all night long in different mock trials. And after that last mock trial, you go crucify him. And at that time, when they were done mocking him and put him into trial, they go not to crucify him first, but before the crucifixion, they went to the scourging. A scourging was a nasty, nasty dealing. They would tie his hands over his head with his back exposed to a lictor. And a lictor would take a, a, a rod, it's cat and nine tails with leather straps, and inside that there'd be balls and bones and hooks. And he would be strapped to a rock or strapped to a, to a, a mantle, exposed to his back, his thighs, and his shoulders, and his head. And that lictor would take that whip and hit his exposed body, and the balls upon that cat and nine tails would just make his meat of his back tender. But then the hook would come into his back and they would just rip it off to the point that the meat and the blood were just rushing off of those men. It was very sad. To a point that sometimes they were so grotesque that ribs would rip from their side. They would fall almost unconscious to the ground. And then, after they had been scourged, they said, go. They put a hundred pound cross beam upon his back. And they said, I need you to carry this cross beam with whips up to the hill of Golgotha, up to be crucified. So here this man that was innocent, that was just scourged, now he is carrying a wooden cross of 100 pounds upon his back, being whipped the entire time with all of his energy, all of his pain just rolling off of his face. The Bible says he was going to be marred like no one could even recognize him. It was a cruel, gruesome, grotesque way to die. Even the Bible says... In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 52, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, as one would scarcely know, he was even a man. That was Isaiah, prophesied 700 years before the event took place. Now they get Jesus up on the hill. He's exhausted. He's tired. The blood running off of him. His dried blood was put upon a, a robe. The robe was on his back and they peeled the robe 
off of his back and the dry skin came with it, which allowed the blood to start oozing even more. They laid him down on this wood beam and the most sensitive areas of, their, of his body, his hands and his feet. They stretched his hands out as far as he could go and they put this six to seven inch nail into his hands. Could you just hear the beat into his hands? Both of his hands, excruciating pain. They pulled his feet together and one nail through his feet. And then they lifted that cross up and slammed it into the hole. All of a sudden you hear the gasp of Jesus' breath. A man that knew no sin became sin for us. Then they started mocking him. They started mocking him. Here's your king. You know what's unique about the crucifixion? About every day in the Roman Empire, there'd be about 6,000 crucifixions. And even some of those crucifixions were women, but very rarely. But when the women were crucified because of some very grotesque deeds that they would have done, they would crucify a woman with her face facing the crowd. Because even the, the worst of men had a hard time seeing women being crucified in the agony in their face. So they would crucify a woman facing the cross. But men, they would face the accusers. And those accusers would be mean. They would vile them. They would rail accusations against them. They would threaten them. And the man that was on the cross couldn't breathe. He would, he would try to rise up and he tried to get a breath and people would yell at him and mock him and he would get mad so he would mock back. He would just say whatever he wanted to say. He knew that his time was at close at hand, whether it was hours or maybe even a day. But you know what the Bible says? That Jesus never said a word. That Jesus was crucified and people were mocking him and yelling at him and belittling him. But Jesus never said a word until this time where the man on his side said, Father, remember me when you go into your paradise. And Jesus' first words on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Below this men, these three men at the cross would be on the ground would be blood Sweat, and yes, urine. Everything for these hours, these dehydrated men would be in the baking sun, and at night, the chilling cold. Everyone mocking them, laughing them. This, as Josephus said, was the most wretched death imaginable. The cross. And you ask, why would Christianity use the cross as that emblem? Why would we celebrate Good Friday? Why would we say this was a good news? We just, we just saw what mankind, what you and what I did to Jesus because of our sin. Why would we call it good? It's wretched. It's despicable. Why could we call it good? It's because of what Jesus did upon that cross. See, God became man, and we did that to him. He, God, came down for us, and what we did is we put him on that cross. Isaiah chapter 53 says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deep grief. He turned his backs on them, and he looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. What, what did he accomplish? What did he accomplish that was so overwhelming upon that cross? When somebody that does not know Christ would say, so, so, he died on the cross. 6,000 people a day died on the cross on the Roman Empire. Why was Jesus any different? 
Why was Jesus' death on the cross something that was, that was so awesome that, that Christianity is based upon this emblem of the cross? And I want you to take these three words. It's a doctrine that is absolutely so important that we want to talk about it. It's called penal substitutionary atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. Penal means we have sinned against God and the penalty of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God that knew no sin, became death for you so you would not have to pay the penalty of death. That's the penalty. The penalty. The penal substitutionary means he took your place. He died so you would not have to die. He became your substitute so you would not have to die. Penal, substitutionary atonement. Atonement was at one with God. There was a breach because of sin. And that breach because of sin made a gulf between God and you. And for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the payment for your sin was Jesus, the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, that knew no sin, became the substitutionary atonement for mankind. Even when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus, John the Baptist saw him here, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. He became our substitutionary atonement. He brought us from sin unto God. That is penal, substitutionary atonement. It is so important that we have that and we understand what it's all about. To lose the fact of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We cannot, nor shall we ever just say, he died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Except that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus didn't just die on the cross. Jesus took my sin upon himself. He took my penalty of damnation upon himself. The penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. When you talk about that, the substitutionary, we say, Jesus, thank you. When, it would be like somebody, it would be like your brother or your sister coming in and your mom or dad got mad and you did something stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And your dad came home from work. Anybody? And your mom says, you wait till your dad gets home. Anybody ever, dad ever say that? You wait till your dad. Ooh, I can handle mom, but when dad gets home, that's a whole different ball game. And you're in trouble. You sit there and you're just scared to death. You're hoping dad works overtime. You're hoping mom gets like Alzheimer's and forgets everything that ever happened. But, but dad comes home and you hear mom and dad talking in the back room. Bruce, get in here. Oh, oh my gosh, this is going to be horrendous. But your brother says, Bruce, why don't you stay seated? I'll go in, and I'll take your punishment. Really? <laughs> you know dad is chapped, right? Yeah, I know he's chapped. But you know, last week, when you got in trouble, that was me that actually did that, so I'm just going to take your punishment this time. So he takes my punishment. He takes the substitutionary punishment. Jesus did not just take the whipping for us. Jesus went to the cross and died for us. Penal, substitutionary atonement. At one with God. We have to have atonement. We have to have atonement. When we have atonement, it changes everything. Now, the word for in these verses are phenomenal. Jesus did something for us. When we talk about Christ, we talk about the substitutionary death, the atonement for our sins. Listen to these words for in all these scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised 
for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and he, by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's us. He made intercession for us. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love toward us, and while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, for I delivered to you the first of all that was besieged, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 1 Peter 3, 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just and the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and he said unto sin, but he himself is the propitiation or the substitute for our sins, and not for our sins only, but the sins of the entire world. And in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He became sin. He didn't just die on the cross. He became sin on that cross. We said this many times, but the agony of the pain on his body was the the scourging, was the nails on his head, the whips on his back, the blood that he shed was the physical pain. Jesus being man felt that pain, the agony. But there was a deeper pain. That deeper pain is the sin. He became sin that knew no sin so we could have righteousness with God. Every sin that you've ever committed, every thought that you've ever had, every action that you've ever performed was nailed to Jesus on that cross. It wasn't just nailed externally. It was put upon him. He felt that pain. He felt that addiction. He felt that withdrawal. He became sin. Oh, Jesus died on the cross. Those three hours, he was on the cross, and he came off that cross, and now everything's great. No, Jesus didn't just die on that cross. The perfect lamb of God became sin so you could have heaven. So when you think about the cross, when you think about that crucifixion, it comes deeper than just Jesus dying on the cross. The most important scripture I want to share with you is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And this is where Martin Luther gets the great exchange. He says this, For he made himself who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he made him, for God made Jesus, who knew no sin, become sin for us, that we might become righteous to God. It's an exchange. Martin Luther, the great exchange, says this. This is that mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners. We're in by a wonderful exchange. Our sins are no longer ours but Christ. And the righteousness of Christ, not Christ, but ours. He has emptied himself of his righteousness that we might clothe us with it and fill us with it. And he has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. It's the great exchange. Listen and watch this. My sin for his perfection. My sin for his perfection. My unrighteousness was put upon him. His righteousness was given to me. My condemnation was put upon him. He gave me his salvation. My death was given to Christ. His life came to me. My separation from God the Father was put upon him. But my reconciliation 
to God was given to me. Let's do those again. My sin was given to him. His perfection was given to me. My unrighteousness was given to him. His righteousness was bestowed upon me. My condemnation was given to him. His salvation was given to me. My death, for the wages of sin is death, was put upon him. His life was given to me. My separation from God was put upon him. Even God turned his back. But his reconciliation was put upon me because of the cross, because of that atonement. It means I can stand before God and be fully justified. It means I'm a new creation with a new heart, new desires, new passion, new purpose. The power to live with, for, and be like Christ was given to me because what Jesus did on that cross. It is not Jesus just died on the cross for our sins. It is much deeper than that. It is a reconciliation, an atonement. It's redeeming. It's not, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. Really? The blood that he shed, the forgiveness that he offered, he didn't just die on that cross. He became you on that cross. He took your sin on that cross. Not only your sin today, your sin from the past, your sin today, and your sin into tomorrow. When God looks at you, when you have given your life to Christ, he does not see you. He sees the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. God has forgiven you. That's why we can celebrate Good Friday, because the Bible-believing church has to believe that Jesus Christ redeemed them. He didn't just save them. He didn't just say, there's your fire insurance. He gave you a righteous life. He gave you hope. He gave you something that you could not get on your own. He gave you reconciliation to God. That's why when you look at your life and you're saying, oh, I've been too bad. Oh, nobody would forgive me. Really? Jesus came to this earth to redeem mankind. And when we believe that, the love of God, the forgiveness of God is overwhelming. But there is a conflict. There is a conflict. And let's listen to that conflict. I'm going to read two verses to you, one verse that you know and one verse that should inspire you. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love. For God so loved the world. But you know what? Him giving the one that he loved showed love and showed wrath. Because that atonement had to be pacified. Had to be paid for. And he was willing to come to this earth and die so we could have life. That was the love of God. But then there's also the wrath of God in there. At the cross, the two meet in a strange intersection of God's holy love and God's redeeming wrath. Because without God's love, we would not have God's wrath. We take it in two different terms. In destinations, we see we have heaven and we have hell. If you have the love of God and the forgiveness of God and you've accepted what Jesus Christ has done for you and you've accepted that atonement and you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and all of your sins were placed upon his back and he suffered and died for you, then you gain heaven. Not because of what Jesus died on the cross, but because you have accepted his atonement that he paid to give you reconciliation to God. But if you do not receive that, this next verse should scare whatever it is out of you. It says this, John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. 
We all love the love of God. We talk about the love of God, we want the love of God, but there's a day that if you die and you've never accepted that atonement of what Jesus Christ did for your sins, the penal substitutionary atonement that wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you die in your sins, you will die without being justified. You will go to hell. Oh, pastor, you shouldn't say that word hell. The Bible does. And the Bible says there's two distinct destinations. And there's only one way to get out of the destination of hell, and that is I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's not about destination. I want to follow Jesus. You can't get to God without going through the atonement of the redeeming quality of the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ that paid the price of sin for mankind. You can't do it. He who believe in the Son hath everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. There was a day in the Old Testament on a yearly basis called the Day of Atonement. And in the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come in and everyone would come into the temple guard grounds. And they would come in and they would bow and they would give incense and they would pray to the high priest, pray to God. And the high priest would bring two unblemished lambs into the temple. Perfect lambs. No blemish. In the Old Testament, that represented Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world all the way back in the Old Testament. And it brought up every year. And that high priest would pray over one of those lambs and he would put every sin that anyone had ever confessed, he would put that sin upon that lamb. And the first lamb was called the sacrificial lamb. And on that sacrificial lamb, he would pray and put all the sins of everyone that came in, he would put that sin upon, imputed that sin upon that lamb. And this is what's the nasty part. Then he would take that lamb, he would take a knife, and he would slit the throat of that goat and the blood would be shed, and that goat would die. That's the sacrificial lamb. Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. And then there was another goat, and the other goat was the, called the scapegoat. One goat is dead. The blood is going through the street. The next goat is alive, perfect, unblemished, and that high priest would lay his hands on that goat and he would impute the sins of everyone upon that goat and then he would release that goat and that goat would go out of the city saying the sins are not only covered under the blood but they're gone from your life. It's called the scapegoat. Jesus is not only our high priest he does not only impute our sin upon him, upon the cross. We do not have to go to someone to put our sins upon God. He is our advocate. He is our high priest, representing the whole nation, representing the body, representing his family. And then the sacrificial goat, the sins of all mankind were imputed upon Jesus and he became that sacrificial lamb. He died. He shed his innocent blood and our sins were imputed, were put upon him. And then he became our scapegoat. Sins imputed on him and that was released. It was in preparation of Jesus in the Old Testament and it's imparted to us today. See, Jesus didn't just die on the cross. We don't just wear a chain around our neck with a cross and expect to be called a believer. When we say, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? It changes everything. He just didn't die on the cross. God became man. And that's what we did to him because he wanted to have a life with you. He willingly 
became the sacrificial lamb because you and God were at odds with each other. That's called sin. And Jesus came down and we imputed our sin upon him and he died and he takes that sin away. Our next series, we're talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very difficult thing. We cannot experience forgiveness. We cannot ask for forgiveness until we understand the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. Because once we've accepted him and what he's done, when God looks at you, he doesn't see any of your sin. He sees the perfect Lamb of God. He sees the sin that Jesus put upon his back and died for. And he said, it is finished. He bowed his head. The sin is gone. We have to accept that your sin is gone. My sin is gone. I heard a story of a young man that was giving his family all kinds of problems. Growing up, he was addicted to drugs and addicted to alcohol, and he had all kinds of problems. He was kicked out of the house multiple times. He was kicked out of the house. They, they felt sorry for him, so they'd bring him back in. He'd, he would do something else, and he would go through juvenile detention centers. He ended up going to jail. He just had a horrendous life, and he just seemed like he could not make the proper decision. Later on in life, he came back to his mom and dad, broken, of everything that he has done. And he said, Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. I not only sinned against people, I stole from you. I used things from this house that wasn't mine, and I used you. I lied to you, and I stole from you. The dad got up without saying a word. The boy thought dad was going to get chapped, get mad, kick him out of the house, do whatever he wanted to do. He said, son, you stay right there. You stay right there. He got up. He was gone for about 30 minutes. He came back to the house with a bag. He said, son, take your shirt off. The boy thought, man, he has a whip in the bag or something. The boy takes his shirt off, and the dad takes out a brand new white long sleeve shirt. And he said, son, I need you to put this shirt on. He said, why? He said, because I knew that you sinned against me. I knew that you sinned against your mother. I knew that you sinned against your friends. But I choose to see you as Jesus sees you. Because if I don't see you the way that Jesus sees you, Jesus can't see me the way that I need him to see me. I am a sinner deserving death, but Jesus paid that price. I can only see you the way that Jesus sees you. Now, who is it? Whether it's you yourself, or whether it's somebody that you need to go to the store and you need to buy them a white shirt. If we are not willing to forgive those that have odd against us, have we really experienced the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon our life? The only way that we will be able to see them in the purest of light, in the forgiving of light, is to be able to give them to God and say, Lord, give me the ability, number one, to forgive myself, to look at myself the way that you look at me as righteous, not because I deserve righteousness, because I am a dirty, rotten sinner, because I've accepted you and you've atoned for my sin. And once I can do that, I can look at people in my life that I have wronged, that have wronged me, and I can say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. The only way that we're willing to do that is if we're willing to be honest with God. This is probably one of the hardest sermons to preach because it hits 
Every person. Every one of us. We all have those animosities. The spirit of fear, the spirit of anger, the spirit of unforgiveness, and even the spirit of failure upon ourselves. But when we look at what Jesus Christ did upon that cross, he did not just die. He gave us a spirit of life, power, forgiveness, and the ability to live a happier, more fruitful life in the name of Jesus Christ. Self has to get off the throne. Christ has to be put on the throne, and forgiveness has to be thrown out of our life into other people's hands. That's when we have joy, peace, and happiness. This invitation, who do you need to give a shirt to? And that shirt that you have to give, maybe you need to put that shirt on yourself. And if you can't put that shirt on yourself, and you can't see yourself the way that God sees you, you will never be able to give that shirt to somebody else. Because the only way that we can see who God is, is if we see who God has done. My sin was imputed upon Christ. He became my substitutionary atonement. He died in my place. And I say, thank God. When was the last time you just said, thank you? When was the last time you understood that the cross that he died on was a tool in which I have access to God? Jesus died on the cross for me. He became sin for me. He took my sin away from me. All I can do is worship him. Let us stand, if we would, to our feet. This invitation is for you. If you have somebody that you need to pray for, if you need to talk to God about somebody that you need to pray for, if you need to ask God to forgive you of something, right now is an opportunity for you to take that white, clean shirt, that robe of righteousness, and ask God to put that upon you and never forget what Jesus Christ has done for you, through you, and with you because he is the power of salvation. He is the ability to live our life clean, new, with a purpose. He became our substitute so we can have his righteousness. If we live that way, we would be happy that way, and God would be honored in that way.